I had planned to do a fourfold summary of the Gospels this morning, and I've left that material available to you on the back table off to the right. But the elders said, we want you to speak about this. And so whenever the elders ask you to speak about this, you speak about this. And so I was delighted that they wanted to encourage me to share with you about why we sing. I asked Ethan about a song, and he didn't know the old song. Some of you old folks would remember Tennessee Ernie Ford. And you would remember him singing, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know. He watches me. So we want to think a little bit this morning about singing and why we sing, or perhaps why we don't sing. Singing is a cultural experience that people have enjoyed ever since the beginning. What was it, Genesis 4, Glenn, that Tubal Cain had created those musical instruments? And so people have been singing for a long, long time. But why do we sing is the question. Robert Ingersoll was a 19th century agnostic. That means he didn't really believe there was a God. He was a follower of naturalism, and he had no belief in the eternal. But he stressed the importance of living only in the here and now. And Ingersoll made light of the Bible, stating that free thought will give us truth. He called the Bible a fable, an obscenity, a sham, and a lie. He claimed that the Christian creed was the ignorant past bullying the enlightened present. In 1879, Mr. Ingersoll was called upon to speak at the funeral of his brother. And standing by his departed brother's grave, this most noted infidel said, Life is a narrow veil between the cold and barren peaks of two eternities. We strive in vain to look beyond the heights. We cry aloud, and the only answer is the echo of our wailing cry. Mr. Ingersoll suddenly died on July 21st in 1899. His family was shocked. His friends were stunned, and his wife, devastated. In their book, The Evangelist and the Agnostic, George and Donald Sweeting wrote, The public response to his passing was that of hopelessness. The memorial service included the notice, There will be no singing. Aren't you glad that God made us to worship in such a way that honors Him, but benefits us? Throughout the Bible, singing has been an integral part of worship. Singing is something that we look forward to when we all come together to be with the Lord in heaven. Following the release from Egyptian bondage and the escape from Pharaoh's pursuit, Moses and the Israelites rejoiced in praise. It was the song of Moses, later the song of the Lamb. I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously, Exodus 15, verse 1. And after the Philistines were defeated and the Ark of the Covenant was returned, David offered this psalm of praise to Jehovah. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing psalms to Him. Talk of His wondrous works. Glory in His name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. 1 Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 10. The Chronicles speak so much about singing. I wonder if that's why we maybe haven't appreciated as much, because we haven't read much from the Chronicles lately. Unlikely, unlike the depressing hopelessness of Ingersoll's funeral when there would be no singing, when the people of God gather, there will be singing, at least until recently. Have you noticed that today, if you do go to a funeral, if there is a funeral, that rarely is there much singing even among God's people? And if it is, it's almost always a recording rather than the audience being invited to sing. 
not only in this life, but in that heavenly land. When we bask in the glow of God's love, we get to sing His praise forever. Second century evidence is that God's people sang. They asserted in their singing, as Pliny the Younger is writing to Trajan, saying, what am I supposed to do with these people? They get together really early on Sunday morning, and they sing chants to this Jesus as if He's a God. And he says the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively. That means they sung to each other. They sung a hymn, which is a serious doctrinal teaching in song, a hymn to Christ as to a God, and to bind themselves by oath not to do some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return the trust when called upon to do so. So Trajan, what am I supposed to do? I, I caught a couple of these women doing that. Should I kill them? The only thing I can find is they're worshiping this Jesus as a God and they're singing to each other. And it's early in the morning that they get together on a particular day and they sing to one another a hymn to Christ as a God. He gave me a song. We need to sing it. We need not to be afraid of singing it. There are so many things that maybe we haven't thought about about singing. I recently surveyed a group of young people asking them why they don't feel comfortable singing. And they had some pretty good answers, I thought. Some of those answers were basically, I can't hit the high notes. I don't know the music. I don't recognize the song. It's pitched too low. I don't like other people hearing me sing. I feel self-conscious if I'm singing and other people are singing. And, and I, I don't have a strong voice. Maybe that's some of the things you've been thinking. Maybe it is the fact that, well, my parents don't sing. Why should I sing? My dad doesn't sing. As a boy, I, I guess guys aren't supposed to sing. All kinds of reasons. Or, or there are other people that can sing so much better, I don't, I don't, want, to mess, I don't want to mess up the singing. There, there are lots of reasons, perhaps reasons given. But singing is something we do, or at least should do, regularly. But most of us probably haven't thought a lot about it. There are many things regarding singing that deserve deliberate consideration both to ensure that we're, what we're doing is pleasing to God and to ensure that singing has the impact on our lives that God intended. So I want you to just think about just about every time God's people to get together, isn't there at least one song? It doesn't have to be, but a lot of times. Isn't prayer and singing the two things that we do just about always when we come together? Those are the things that we participate almost every time. And so it was the study on Thursday when Wayne walked us through Psalm 93 that the old men that got together saw how many times God's majesty is expressed. His greatness, His glory, His awe, and how you just want to sing His praise once you see who He is. We often take that for granted. So how many examples can you think of Christians singing in the first century? Examples where you're watching Christians singing together. I think there's only one, which shocked me when I thought about it. You, you don't necessarily see an example of the Christians singing in an assembly. Now there are several passages that are going to indicate we're supposed to, but the only time I can read an example of some people singing in the New Testament was in a jail. They were prisoners. They'd been beaten. And they're praying and they're singing hymns of praise to God. And that's Paul and Silas. And all of the prisoners hang around when they're free to leave after the earthquake. 
And the jailer comes in trembling. What must I do to be saved? Singing had a tremendous influence on what had happened. I heard Stan say recently about asking the song leaders to lead songs in preparation for the prayer. And one song leader said, Preacher, you preach your sermon and I'll preach mine. And so the point is that singing is instructional. Singing is teaching. Singing is training. And so it's such a vital part of not only worship to God, but helping each other to sing. Now obviously there's a lot of singing in the book of Revelation. There's a lot of singing around the throne of God. And I don't mean this in any unkind way, but if you don't like or don't want to sing praise to God with whatever voice He's given you here, do you think that when you get to heaven you're just going to want to sing praise to God? Is there going to be something magical that's just changed that now maybe you've finally seen His glory and now you want to sing out? His praise, not because you have a perfect voice, not because you can hit the highness or the low notes, because you love Him. And you just naturally want to sing His praise. And so as we think about watching the New Testament, there are some instructional references in the New Testament, but they don't spend much time or space giving instructions about singing. Perhaps the limited number of references to singing in the New Testament is one reason we don't spend much time thinking about singing itself. As I was asked to speak on this subject, I got to thinking back about childhood and thinking back about how often I heard singing as a kid. I heard it at home. My dad loved music. He loved to sing. He wasn't a great singer. But he would invite the men of the congregation to come in and teach him how to sing, how to pitch a song. And and every Sunday morning, the radio is on and Christians are singing. And then as we're traveling, as dad's going out in the country to preach, as teenagers, we're listening to singing as we go. It was all preparatory to our worship. It, It was just something that happened just about every day. Singing was such a part of the culture. So I want you to think of the value of drawing upon the Old Testament in learning the heritage of singing in worship. Perhaps we get the impression regarding the New Testament and music that we should ignore what the Old Testament holds. That would be a mistake. Responsive singing is what you see in the Scriptures. Let me do an exercise with you. Would you turn your Bible to Psalm 136? Psalm 136. This is a model of the kind of singing that would have been done. And by the way, do you know what the songbook was for first century Christians? Their songbook, you're looking at it. It's the psalm book. They had 150 songs that they sang. Now there were probably some new ones like Oceans that some of us didn't know. And they would have to teach it, and they would have to sing it back and forth until they got it. So could we... I'm I'm not going to ask you to do that. I want you to think about how this group would be singing to this group, and this group would be singing back. That would be most likely the way they would have done it. The first group says, and the reason I'm hesitating is because I don't want any ladies to feel uncomfortable. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And you answer, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Then you say, give thanks to the Lord of God's, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of Lord's, for His loving kindness is everlasting. It's a response. You are emphasizing repetitively, responsively to each other what these truths of God are. And singing is something that the whole church is supposed to do together. It's not a choir performance. It's not a solo. It's all of us singing together. So Psalm 36 is an example of God's loving kindness. So when you look in Revelation chapter 5, and you see examples of singing, you'll notice the emphasis of the worship of God. 
Jesus was a singer. And he would sing probably the Hallel Psalm. Psalm 118 was most likely what they sang right after the Passover. They sang several songs during the Passover observance. And so as we think through the message and the glory and the splendor of God, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Here's a new song, because now the Lamb that was slain is now standing. And so when you look in Revelation 14, they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one can learn the song except the 144,000 who've been purchased from the earth. You are the special people of God chosen by Him to sing His praise. And so in chapter 15, they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. You see the excitement and the fervor of people who are wanting to praise God? John sees those who have conquered the beast, like the exodus from Egypt, singing the song of Moses. Many references to singing and songs in the Old Testament, and not just in the Psalms. Chronicles are full of them. The songs and the psalms of the Old Testament are often quoted in the New Testament and especially in Luke and Acts and Hebrews. We learned this morning in class the song that Simeon sang from the book of Isaiah. So what the Old Testament says about praising God, especially in song, is deserving of significant study to note some key observations in regard to singing as a response to God, to His goodness, to His greatness, to His unchanging nature. Hold to God's unchanging hand. To His concern for those who are His people and those who are not yet His people. It is critically connected to thankfulness. And it is a demonstration of the fruit of our lips that is a sacrifice to God. He doesn't want bloody animal sacrifices. He wants the fruit of our lips. He wants us to bring that to Him as individuals and together. Sermon and song. Is that what we call it? Sermon and song is next Sunday. And I'm really excited to share about that. I want to share with you just a little bit personally. I guess I just didn't appreciate how much my dad taught me in singing at home, singing in the assemblies, when he would have worked all night long on Saturday night. And then he would come in Sunday morning and he would sing. Now, I must, t- I must tell you, he did get a little sleepy sometimes during the sermon. He'd been up for a day. But man, what a powerful example. Dads, I am pleading with you. I don't care whether you can hit a lick of a note I am pleading with you to sing the praise of God that your children can see and see that my dad loves God. He's the great king that my father served. I am pleading with you to do that. My dad gave me so much, I just didn't realize. But I want you also to know from a personal level, the first time I came here to worship with you all late last fall and then came back when Bradley Moore was doing a sermon in song. Ah, it filled my heart. I hadn't been close and tight with folks singing their hearts out with really neat and great songs for a while. It meant so much to me that you were a family who wanted to praise God in song. It helped a whole bunch. And it still does. And so, how is it my God is so big? so strong and so mighty 
There's nothing my God cannot do. What really helps children is to see their dad and to see their granddad up singing the songs that children love. Sing and Be Happy is one of the top-notch songs of my generation. I'm surprised that the kids still ask for it often. They want to see their dad sing. They want to hear. They don't care whether he hits the high notes or the low notes, but that he sings praise to God. And it's not so much about doing it in front of everybody else, but please do it at home. Sing with your kids. By the time we get to the New Testament, it's almost like, what more do I need to say? If you know anything about my desire for you to sing praise to me, you should have it by now. Now the Greeks, the Gentiles, they had to learn that. And so you'll notice it's in those contexts, like Ephesians and Colossians, that the instructions are given. And so in 1 Corinthians, a very Gentile town, they've gotten confused some things about how we're supposed to do stuff and how the Holy Spirit is going to direct all that. And in verse 13, therefore one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit. And I'll pray with my mind also. I'll sing praise with my spirit. But I'll sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say, Amen! to your thanksgiving, when he doesn't know what you're saying. If we mumble or we do not articulate, if we do not enunciate, if we do not speak clearly, how can people know what we're saying? 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26 will go on to say, What then, brothers, when you come together? Each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, that all things be done for building up. Can you just see the Corinthians here? Hey, I got a song. I got one. I got a hymn. I got a, I got a praise. Can I sing mine? Well, it has to be done decently. It has to be in order. You have to take turns. But you can just see the enthusiasm of sharing in singing. And then Ephesians chapter 5, another Gentile church. Therefore, don't, don't be foolish. You need to understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine. That's debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Making melody with your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We not only need to sing, we need to hear others singing. They're they're teaching us, they're instructing us. This design is not helpful for that. In times past, there was much more of a semicircular style of building where everybody could see each other Singing. Colossians 3 is going to emphasize, and above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. As I mentioned as a kid, I didn't really realize how much my parents were prepping me for worship. That it was every Sunday at 8 o'clock in the morning on channel WETZ, that we were hearing the singing of brethren. In fact, it was brethren from the congregation where I worshipped in a little town of about 250 brethren. And, And we were getting prepped. We were getting primed for that. Guys, what are you prepping your kids for on Sunday morning? What I what I often observe is we're prepping, but it's on this little screen. And I don't think it's the hymns of God that we're prepping. That's what we're watching. That's that's what we're following. And then I look and I look at your preteen child. He's doing the very same thing on his phone. That's not preparation for worship. That's preparation for anything but worship. And it's having a very negative effect on your kids. 
thankfulness to the Lord, wanting to praise Him, a sacrifice of praise to Him, which is the fruit of my lips. I want my kids hearing me say, thank you, God. Now, we're not going to expose every verse in its entirety, but I want you to kind of think about some of the principles that we've seen here. We need to sing with our spirit. That's our person. That's who we are. Our spirit corresponding to God's spirit is foundational in our worship. And it's got to be in our mind. It's got to be our understanding. There are just some things that we can't sing because we don't know what it means. Let the lower lights be burning. Do you know what that's about? We might think we do. We might not. How about night with ebon pinion brooding o'er the veil? Do we understand what we're singing? There's a number of songs that we, we maybe don't sing because we don't agree with what's being said in them. Or we can't sing it truthfully. Because it's not right. We're, what we're living is not what we're singing. And so our heart's got to be involved. And there has to be a thankfulness in our heart when we're singing, especially the connection of singing and thankfulness to God. So importantly, the one thing in all these passages share in common is that we do this together, one another. By all means, I encourage you to sing in the shower. Sing as you're prepping with the kids going to bed. But the instruction here is because we do that at home, because we worship at home, we can't wait to get together and sing together. Some people have said, our audience when we're singing is God. That's true. We're singing to God. That's what a gracious, appreciative person does. But we're not just singing to God. We're also singing to each other. And we consider each other when we sing. And please consider, when you don't sing, that speaks volumes to not only your kids, but the other people that are near you in assembly. It says either he can't sing, maybe he has laryngitis, maybe his throat's about to go out, but why is he not singing? That should be of grave concern to fellow worshipers because our relationship is with each other. We're considering one another. We're wanting to provoke each other to love, to good works. And we're singing that. We're marching on design. We're marching on up the hill, singing each other toward heaven. So why is singing so important? Well, we could easily just say because God said so. And he did. But why did he say so? We need to sing with understanding. And we need to reject vain songs. Amos chapter 5, I used to read that as a kid thinking, oh, God doesn't like instruments of music and worship. That's not the point at all in Amos chapter 5. In, in Amos chapter 5, they're just singing and they're not thinking about God. They're still thinking about Egypt. Same thing in Amos chapter 8. We can sing songs and not mean a word of it. It's just vain. It's just empty. It's not worship to God. And oftentimes we can just get to singing and we're not, we don't have a clue what we just said. So that's certainly not what God is looking for. You know, I used to like to think that, well, the music doesn't matter. Words are what is important. And it is by far the words are most important. In fact, they probably had little musical training as churches in the first century. They were antiphonally back and forth saying a message. There may have been a little bit of a melody to it. But what they were saying was what was important. But music does matter. When music matches the message, it is so powerful. But we can really get messed up with too much music focus. Those who may be trained musically can actually be distracted from worshiping with the words God has instructed. Because we're wanting to make sure we got that D flat just right. Or somebody missed on the shield about me that tight harmony. What about God? He's the shield about me. So music need not be a distraction from the real focus. And then singing as we do really helps us. Some of you know I recently had an MRI. Wasn't fun, right? Wasn't fun. They wanted to check and see if I had a brain or not. 
And they didn't tell me that they were going to put this mask. They said, oh, we're going to put your helmet on. I thought, okay, helmet. But they didn't tell me they were going to put the mask down. I'm not trying to freak you out. But what I kept doing during that exercise was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And then most of you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts. These are memory devices. This helps us to remember. Singing, you know, we do that a lot with our little kids. When did we quit doing it with our big kids? Singing melodies actually help us with the message. To remember the message. So seeking, singing teaches us personally and family. Do some of you know, seek ye first the kingdom? You're singing a passage. I think that's Matthew 6, 33. Some of you know, unto thee, O Lord. And you've just gone right to Psalm 25. Because you've got a melody tied to the message. I didn't know this was going to happen this morning, but I wrote down, The Lord is in His holy temple. Haggai 2, verse 20. And did you notice the somberness of the assembly after that? And just the quietness to think about we're in the presence of a holy God. Music does that. It connects the message in our minds. And singing teaches us personally, teaches our family, teaches our friends, teaches fellow prisoners, if I could go back to Acts chapter 16. So consider how we often begin teaching our children. It's with songs. For some reason, we've abandoned songs as a teaching tool at some point to our own disappointment. But aren't we concerned about what teenagers sing? One of the cultural things that has happened in the last 10 to 20 years is teenagers don't sing. They don't sing. You know, when some of us were kids, man, we sang a lot. And as teenagers, we got together on Saturday and we would sing spiritual songs and then we'd go to some widow's house on Saturday night and, and have her suffer through what we were doing. We thought we were helping her. We sang. But it was pre-earbud era. And so today, young people, almost all that they get musically is what they hear. Very little is what they sing. Now, little kids, oh man, they'll belt it out. But they get to be 8th and ninth graders, mum's the word. Something happened, peer pressure, something happened that said, I'm not supposed to sing anymore and I'm judging myself, and I'm not the best singer. God doesn't care whether you're the best singer. He wants to hear your voice. And if He gave you a voice, He wants to hear from you. And so songs teach us regardless of our age. I wanted to teach you a new song today. Can't do any more of that. When I go home, that's what I want you to sing at my funeral. And you can YouTube it this afternoon, When I Go Home. And my friend, Mike Eldridge, put it together. Before that, it was going to be, Be with me, Lord. I cannot live without you. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need your strength to lean myself upon. You can sing that one at the funeral, too. Dad said, I want a lot of singing at my funeral. You want singing at your funeral? Will you sing at somebody else's funeral? Singing can connect us with deep and profound truths and thoughts in ways that sermons, lectures, never will. I remember a long, long time ago, 40 years ago, in Indianapolis, and we were going to sing It Is Well With My Soul, H.G. Spafford, 1873. And I said to the audience, I said, if it's not well with your soul, please don't sing. I don't want people lying during a song. And one young girl, she was probably about 12 or 13, she stood there during that song, tears flowing down her eyes. It was not long after that that she came to Christ. You know what the first song was when she was baptized into Christ? It is well with my soul. It means something. 
And when Spafford's looking out over that gray ocean Atlantic as he's going to England to meet his wife, she's the only one saved. All the kids drown. And yet it was well with his soul. That's what he believed. It's what he wrote. It's what he sang. In Christ alone. What a great hymn that focuses our attention on God. Singing together as, as a congregation brings us together, binds us together, Lord, as we all come together and unite to sing that God is love. Singing unifies us in a, in a powerful and unique way. And we're never more unified than when we sing as one. If we can't be unified in song, we're never going to be unified in, in the work of the Lord. And singing in harmony and unison requires us to learn to listen. Forty-five years ago, a girl from Athens, Alabama, taught me how to sing. Now, I'd been singing for a while. I sang in high school and college and things like that. It, I'm not going to mention her name, but she's a girl from Athens. And I remember sitting across from her in a hall in Tampa, Florida, and listening to her sing. Could I kindly say she couldn't carry a tune in the bucket? But she was the best singer I had ever heard. She loved God. And you could just see the radiance in her voice and the way she, she was praising God. She didn't care who or what or anybody else. She was there with God. And I, for 45 years, I have thanked God for her because she taught me it's not about whether you hit that F note on tenor. It's about whether you focus on your God. I don't care whether you ever hit a right note or not. Make sure you're in tune with God. That's what worship is about. And that's what our kids learn from us. I need you to sing. I need to hear you sing. I love to tell the story. I love you, Lord. I believe in the one they call Jesus. Uh, you great are God. You are the great God. Jesus, let us come to know You. And Lord, as Stephen Rouse recently wrote, Lord, help me rise up again. So singing requires us to be vulnerable and trust each other. To truly listen. And how much do we devote ourselves and our families to singing out? and to singing His praise. I encourage you to think about that as our time comes to an end. Let's commit ourselves to singing. Healing in its wings. I think it's going to come up on the screen here in a moment. Could you go ahead and move to that message? Ethan offered to lead that. Healing in its wings. Glenda Shales wrote this a few years ago and it speaks to our heart. Oh, Father... I do sin, and my heart breaks deep within. For you have sought me, yet I turn away from all your loving care. So often do I fall, yet you reach out again, lifting my burden that is more than I can ever bear. Can you go back? We'll just go ahead and sing that together. And this is another one that, you know, if you can't sing it, don't sing it. If it's not true in your heart, don't sing it. But if this is true about you and you're looking for healing in your wings from God, then sing to His glory and to the encouragement of everyone else as we stand and sing.